everybody. In this video, we're going to highlight, I think, Hans Isaac and his PEM model. First, we'll talk a bit about Hans Isaac's life and an overview of his biologically based trait taxonomy uh, and theory. Then we'll talk more about his PEN model. What are the three factors that he's decided fit his theoretical paradigm the best? What are the best ways to measure those? What are the most commonly used ways for measuring those? And we'll talk a bit about some related research. So first up, a bit about Hans Eysenck's life. He was born in Berlin in the early 20th century, but he, like a number of the other theorists we've talked about this semester, had to flee that part of the world when Nazi occupation and ideology came to prominence. He settled in Western Europe and received his PhD in London, published extensively throughout his career and while he was living, rose to prominence as one of the most often cited psychologists in history. And he still has that title. He passed away in the late 20th century, but he still has the title of being one of the most often cited researchers in our field. Earlier in the semester, we read about Costa and McRae's five-factor model, or FFM, also referred to as the Big Five. And those are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, excuse me, and neuroticism. So some of the research that's summarized in this chapter, you're very familiar with already through your exploration of Costa McRae's work, but also uh, assignments that were related to that. And, and of course, readings and experiences you have had on your own. I think focused on two of those big five, and he added to his taxonomy a third, which is psychoticism. And so his big three, if you will, are listed on this slide, psychoticism, extroversion, and neuroticism. And for the sake of time, I won't go over every point, uh, certainly that was in your chapter, obviously, or <laughs> that uh, perhaps is outlined on the slide because I'm, I'm going to try to keep this video shorter than the previous one. So in your own words, based upon what you've already read and already reviewed in either the chapter or related assignments, can you describe extroversion? Can you put in your own words why extroversion is referred to as a dimension? What does it mean for something to be a dimension as opposed to a category? Can you also put into your own words what is meant by the phrase, psychologists believe that dimensions like extroversion are normally distributed in the general population. So those are some of the key points and concepts and terms that were hit upon previously in the textbook and in our class that hopefully have stuck and that you're able to apply to this material as well. So in your own words, can you describe extroversion and the dimension of extroversion and the concept that extroversion is normally distributed in the population? Same thing for neuroticism. Can you describe the concept of neuroticism? Can you describe the dimension of neuroticism? What's at both ends? 
of that dimension. And then can you put into your own words what it is meant or rather what is meant when people say neuroticism is believed to be normally distributed in the population? Same thing for psychoticism. This on your screen right now, I'm gonna blow it up so that it, it's a little bit easier to see. This is a fairly widely used scale. Ising's personality questionnaire uh, revised, which is what EPQR stands for. It has a number of items on it and several subscales. One subscale for each of those big three, psychoticism, extroversion, and neuroticism, but also a subscale that measures L. And you ask, what is L? You see how some of the, or well, all the items have a little, have a num, uh, excuse me, have a letter beside them highlighting which subscale they reference. So if you look in that column that contains a letter detailing which subscale, the respective items are a part of, you'll see that some of them have N, E, P, or L. So look at some of the ones with, that have L beside them. Were you ever greedy by helping yourself to more than your share of anything? The next one that has L beside it. Have you ever blamed someone for doing something you knew was really your fault? And after that, have you ever taken anything, even a pen or button, that belong to someone else. So hopefully what's being highlighted by going through a few of these items is that L refers to the lie scale. And psychologists use this as a, a metric tool that helps them preserve the integrity of the questionnaire. And so the theory here is that if you put a lie scale or embed a lie scale in your questionnaire, it should do a good job of helping you flush out who is answering authentically and who is not answering authentically. And as a researcher, or just as a person who's trying to assess an individual, knowing whether or not a person is lying on those other questions will help you basically ascertain whether or not they're likely to be lying on the other subscales that are measuring neuroticism and extroversion and psychoticism. So the belief here is that this life scale will help you flush out who's lying. And if you're a researcher, you probably should toss their data because if they were lying, that means you can't put any credence into their answers. Same thing if you're only giving the questionnaire to one person. Again, you probably should toss those data or at least look at them very skeptically because that means the person is not being authentic and you can't really trust their subsequent scores on any of those questions. All right, I'm going to make this back to a more reasonable size here. Okay, a little bit bigger. All right. Now, so that's one of the widely used measures of the P, E, and N. I think developed four criteria for identifying which characteristics he thought should be included in his taxonomy or a theoretical model. And those four are listed on your screen. So he said there should be psychometric evidence, we actually did not do a factor analysis in this class. These lecture notes were used in another class as well. But you read about factor analysis in your chapter, I think, for sure in the Costa and McCray chapter, but probably in, it was alluded to in chapter one as well. So there should be psychometric evidence such that if you're using the, the standard steps in developing a questionnaire or assessment device, you should be able to design something that is reliable and valid, that uh, has excellent, uh, what we call psychometric properties. It's pretty reliable, the items hang together and they do a good job of measuring the construct that it's purported to measure. So there should be psychometric evidence 
uh, for the, the respective really important traits that should be included in a theory of this nature. Also, um, the characteristic of her heritability. If you're gonna say that a trait is super important such that it needs to be included in a really good theory or a taxonomy of traits, then that, that trait needs to have heritability. So you need to be able to see that there's a biological basis to some degree. It may not be, um, it may not have 100% predictability in terms of its heritability, but it should have a biological basis. And so what we see, for example, from the literature is that extroversion and neuroticism have fairly high levels of heritability. So the estimates of her heritability for E and N are in the 0.5, 0 0.4 to high 0.5 range, which is considerable, especially when you're talking about something like personality traits. Psychoticism has a documented heritability level too. Number three, it must make sense from a theoretical point of view. So what we know about theories is that they should be parsimonious, they should do a good job of explaining and, and summarizing what's already known, they should do a good job of of generating hypotheses so that they can be tested and further refined, et cetera. And so according to the criteria that I think set for the traits that he wanted to include in his taxonomy or theoretical model, he said, another criteria is that it's gotta make sense from a theoretical point of view. So it needs to be consistent with the majority of the literature, for example. And then number four, it must possess social relevance. So for example, I like um, desserts. <laughs> and I um, like to try new things. I like to go new places and meet new people and um, try new experiences. Now, those two things are traits for me, right? So I, I like I like desserts, I like sugary sweets, and I like to go new places, try new things, engage in new experiences. While both of those are traits, one is more telling, one is more relevant, right? And one is more important for you to know if you're going to interact with me or if you're going to you know, work with me or engage with me on some level. So that fourth one, it has to possess social relevance. It can't just be a trait just for the sake of being a trait. It needs to be something that is substantive. So those are the four criteria that I think identified. He also suggested this hierarchical model. So a lot of times when you hear about Ising's PEN model, you'll hear it referenced as his PEN model or his hierarchical model, and sometimes people will put those two together, his PEN hierarchical model. The hierarchical structure of it is depicted here, and this is similar to one of the figures that is in your chapter. And so for each of the three, pardon me, he proposed a hierarchical model such that the trait itself is referred to as a super trait. So in this figure, extroversion is at the top. It is the super trait. And underneath the super trait are sub traits. And so, for example, extroversion can be broken down into dozens of sub traits, things like sociability and talkativeness and um, engagement and what we call surgency, also impulsivity. Those are some of the sub-traits that make up the broader super trait of extroversion. Underneath those sub-traits are habitual acts. So things like entertaining strangers, smiling on average, making energetic, if you will, 
decisions, responses, behaviors, things like that. So habitual types of acts. And then the last level of the hierarchy are specific acts. And there's several examples um, listed there. So that's, this is a picture depicting the hierarchical structure of Ising's PEN model. And it, it's important to note that I think wasn't the first to suggest that for example, extroversion and eroticism are really key or that they're really central to people's personalities. But he is one of the first to develop a theoretical paradigm that would dictate which of the traits should be considered you know, most important and should be included in a theoretical uh, paradigm. Because as we read through Costa and McRae's work, it's atheoretical. There is no theoretical basis to suggest that those five should be the big five. They're just a result of statistical analyses and, and intuition and, and, and things like that, but there's no theoretical basis for why those five or, or why there even should be five. So, so I wanted to highlight just in that moment that one of the contributions that Ising's work really makes to the field. Okay, so we already took a look at one of the widely used measures of P, E, and N. Here's some others mentioned on this slide. Ising is credited with being one of the more prominent developers of questionnaires that assess the big five, but certainly his big three. And again, here is that graphic, just so you, you can jog your memory of some of the items from his EPQR-A that assess P and E and N. And of course, you're welcome to pause the video and, and look at those at greater depth if you like. Okay, so remember, one of the strong points and criteria that I think set for which traits should be included in a theoretical model that contains the most important ones is that the traits should have a biological basis. So um, it is important to note that when I think proposed these criteria, we didn't have the technology to really test out his assertions or his theory that there is a biological basis, for example, for E or N or P, it was based on, largely on speculation. But since then, we have developed things like fMRI and PET scans, positron emission tomography, things like that, that do allow us to test out the theory and the biological basis, if you will, of P and E and N. And so based upon the literature, uh, three-fourths of the variance of personality dimensions really can be accounted for by heredity. And so we don't have to rely on speculation solely or on primate studies. We can look at things like twin studies and adoption studies and fMRI. We're looking at oxygenated blood flow in the brain for people who score higher versus lower on extroversion when they're exposed to various stimuli and people who score higher versus lower on neuroticism when they're exposed to various stimuli just to see how brain activation in the limbic system and, and so on, how it looks literally real time. So there is support in the literature for that assertion. Yeah, and, and it is pan-cultural. These three are pan-cultural and the biological support or physiological evidentiary support for those three. That's also pan-cultural. We see that in a lot of replicated studies. So some of the related research personality is correlated with disease. So mortality and morbidity actually 
And you can read more about that in the chapter. Again, I'm trying to not make these as long as they could be. <laughs> trying to go for shorter videos and certainly should read more about the background literature in the book. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. But uh, yes, things like neuroticism and pessimism and type A personality, those are correlated with poorer health outcomes in many instances. There, are, there is some research <clears throat> excuse me, relating neuroticism with better health outcomes in a few instances, but uh, for the most part, you do see a correlation between pessimistic outlook and higher rate of illness, also higher rates of neuroticism and <clears throat> higher rates of illness, illness lasting longer those types of things. Type A has been explored with heart disease and arthrosclerosis. So, and, but it's always important to reiterate the fact that correlation does not imply causation, right? So just because neuroticism is correlated with poor prognosis, lengthier time, for a cold or for the flu, just because there's a correlation doesn't mean that being neurotic is causing people to be ill, just like being ill doesn't necessarily cause people to become neurotic. The correlation just implies a relationship and you really need more research to find out the causal linkages, if any, uh, between those two. Yes, and so on this slide is in a, is a direct reference to some of the other pieces that are cited in your chapter and mentioned briefly. So to recap, we talked a bit about Hans Eysenck's life. We have an overview of the criterion that he specified should be used when deciding which traits are most central. Talked about the traits that he does think are most central in his PEN hierarchical model. We talked about what that hierarchical structure looks like. And finally, we talked a bit about personality as a predictor or correlate of several things. Thanks everybody for listening. It, as is always the case, if you have a question for me, please drop me an email at d-c-o-t-h-r-a-n at a-l-a-s-u dot e-d-u. Thanks.